the Lord. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we rejoice in who you are, Lord, this morning. Just pray that we never forget who you are, Lord. Every single thing that you've done for our lives, Lord. And all that you will do. And we look forward to seeing you soon, Lord. But while we're still here, would you continue to speak to us, teach us, and may we learn and grow in your word and share it with somebody new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen and amen and good morning and welcome. And you can be seated. How are you doing today? Okay, we'll take that one. Uh, those of you online, we're so glad that you're joining with us. Trust that you'll be blessed that you are. We're going to get right to it. Our first service is the Prophecy Update that we do weekly, have for years. Second service is the sermon, a verse by verse study through the Word of God. And today we're going to finish the very long book of Jude, <laughs> all 25 verses of it. And so in so doing, we're going to look at how we keep ourselves in the love of God, who keeps us from falling and presents us without fault forevermore. Very much looking forward to this, the last two verses of Jude. And so that'll be live streamed at 11.15 a.m. Hawaii time. And for those of you online, that are watching by way of YouTube or Facebook, you might want to make your way to the website, jdfrog.org, for the uncensored and uninterrupted entirety of today's update. And with that, let's get started. I want to talk very candidly about a problem that should be taken very seriously in this, the last hour of human history as we know it. And what I'm speaking of is the swiftness with which opposition, dissension, and division has increased specific to the teaching of Bible prophecy. While the teaching of Bible prophecy is still rare and even non-existent in the church today, if and when it's taught, it's rife with contention, dissension, concerning what's being taught. And the problem is, it's seemingly getting worse with each passing week, literally. And it's evidenced by all the arguing and infighting among students and teachers of Bible prophecy, I don't think that the enemy could be any happier. I mean, this alone is very telling by virtue of the fact that Satan is the author of confusion, the accuser of the brethren, and the father of lies. Think this through with me. Wouldn't it stand to reason that this is the reason that Bible prophecy would be one of the bullseyes on his target, as it were, in firing his flaming arrows or missiles, depending on your translation? Why? Well, the reason it's one of the bullseyes in firing his flaming arrows is because he knows he has but a short time, which is why it's being revved up. You know, I'm choosing these words for a reason. And oh, by the way, Satan knows he has but a short time. Would to God that more Christians knew that we have but a short time. This ex explains, not excuses, why there's no urgency in the church today. Urgency to get Jesus to people and people to Jesus. Actually, the very fact that there's such dissension and contention 
is an indicator of just how short the time truly is, which is the impetus for what I want to accomplish today. What do I want to accomplish today? I want to provide all of us, myself included, a biblical and practical template in order to discern between what's true and what's false. The good news is, thankfully, that God doesn't want us to be ignorant about Bible prophecy, which is why well nigh one third of the Bible is prophecy. The Lord knows my heart when I say this and share this, but it is my hope and my prayer that God, as only He can, will enable and empower all of us, again myself included, with much needed clarity in addressing this most serious matter. So that's what I want to accomplish today. I want to begin with a fascinating account starting in Jeremiah 27. For those of you that were with us through our study, through Jeremiah. You might remember these two chapters, 27 and 28, which we'll get to shortly. But in 27, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah and says to him, make for your, yourself yokes and put one of them on your neck. What's a yoke? It's a, it's a wooden yoke that is put around the neck of the ox to bind them together so they work, to sort of enslave them and bound them as these workers. And so this literally happened. And this is what we affectionately refer to as a visual prophecy. What's a visual prophecy? I mean, this actually happened in that Jeremiah did that which he was commanded of the Lord to do, and he made some wooden yokes, and he put one around his neck and wore it around town. That would get somebody's attention. Could you just hear the whispering behind his back? Oh, did you see that necklace that Jeremiah's wearing? What's up with that? Well, that was the whole point of this visual prophecy, was to get them talking and even asking, Jeremiah, what's up with the yoke, man? Why are you wearing that thing around your neck? To which Jeremiah would say, I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you why, because that's why God had him do it. We'll come back to that in a second. Now, he's not only to wear this yoke that he made, this wooden yoke around his neck, but he's also to send all the yokes that he made with messengers to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon. Why? Because all of these nations were banding together, allying together in order to defeat Babylon, the king of Babylon. So these messengers are to use these yokes to prophesy that God has given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And they're also to prophesy that God Himself will punish any nation, any kingdom that refuses to put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, as these wooden yokes around their necks would symbolize prophetically. If they refuse and choose to go against this prophecy, God makes it very clear in no uncertain terms that He will bring on them sword, famine, and pestilence until He has consumed them by His hand. Well, give, give that thing to me. I'll put it on, because I'm not going to let that happen. And that's not all. They're also to warn them in advance that they're not to listen to their ensuing false prophets, 
diviners, dreamers, soothsayers, or sorcerers who will contradict this and oppose this. They even specify exactly how they'll do this when they start falsely prophesying, saying, quote, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. I know Jeremiah has been prophesying that. He's been posting prophecy updates on YouTube about that. Nah, it's not going to happen. Now, question. Why the specificity concerning these false prophets or false influencers? Because they prophesy a lie. They prophesy a lie. Now, these messengers, after telling them all this, they also tell them, that God has prophesied this very same prophecy to Zedekiah, king of Judah. In other words, Judah along with you, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, Sidon, Judah too, will come under the yoke of Babylon. And not only would the Jews be brought under the yoke of the king of Babylon, but so too would the vessels used in the temple in Jerusalem also be taken by the king of Babylon. By the way, spoiler alert, we're going to start Daniel this Thursday, Lord willing. When we get to, I think it's about chapter 4, you remember that account when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's grandson is getting drunk, this, I mean, extended party drinking out of these vessels that were taken to Babylon. Big mistake. Anyway, just you have to wait for like four, five, six, seven weeks if the rapture doesn't happen first before we get to that to see what happened. You know what happens. But they took the vessels too. So not only are the Jews going to be under the yoke of the king of Babylon, but so too are the vessels that were used in the temple going to be also taken by the king of Babylon. Now, would you agree that this prophecy would not be very popular? Who wants to hear that? I mean, it's, it's posted on YouTube. It has like no views. It does have a few comments, and they're not very nice. Because I mean, really? Prophecy update, you're going to be taken captive by the king of Babylon, and not only the Jews, but all of these other nations, and they're going to take all these vessels from the temple before they destroy the temple, and you're going to be taken captive into Babylon under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Have a nice day. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't want to hear that. And they didn't want to hear that. Well, Let's fast forward. Five months later, by the way. This is chapter 28. And we're introduced to one of these false prophets that these messengers said would come. Right on schedule, right on time. So here's this false prophet, his name, Hananiah. And Hananiah does exactly what God prophesied would happen and starts prophesying, watch this, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, oh really? Saying what? Quote, he has broken the yoke of the king of Babylon, and within two full years will bring back all the vessels and all the captives. No worries. Wow. Now we've got a big problem, because the prophecy update Jeremiah previously posted was the polar opposite of this prophecy update that Hananiah just posted. And if this were bad enough, the comments on Jeremiah's social media platforms are scathing, calling him out as a false teacher. 
And now we're faced with this dilemma. Who do I believe? And how do I resolve this discrepancy? Because Jeremiah is over here saying one thing, and Hananiah is over here saying another. As we're about to see, God's going to resolve this quite graphically, incidentally. But He's going to start by having Jeremiah speak the Word of God directly, prophetically, and even publicly to Hananiah. And what he speaks is found in Jeremiah chapter 28, verse 8, where he tells Hananiah, listen to this, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform your words which you have prophesied. Wait, what? He just prophesied falsely, diametrically opposed to that which God had you prophesy. God commanded you to prophesy that Israel would be brought under the yoke of the king of Babylon. And this guy said, nah, nah, that's not going to happen. And you're saying, Amen? Is this Jeremiah like with a sanctified sarcasm? Because if that's what it is, I would have totally done that. I mean, I'd be like, well, I'm not going to tell you what I'd be like, because I don't think it's really a sanctified sarcasm. I think it's really more that Jeremiah wishes Hananiah was right. And Jeremiah deep down inside wishes he was wrong. Which is why he would say, I, basically this, Hananiah, Amen. I would love nothing more for the, than the Lord to do so, as you have prophesied. The only problem is, it's not going to happen. So I don't think, it, maybe there is some sanctified sarcasm, but I just, as we got to know Jeremiah in our study through that book, I just don't see him doing that. He was a very meek man. He's not affectionately referred to as the weeping prophet for nothing. I think he's just heartbroken, because he knows the truth. He knows he's right, wishes he were wrong, wishes Hananiah was right. That would be great if we're only two years out. But he knows that it's 70 years, not two years. So. What is Jeremiah going to do? Well, God has him remind Hananiah that when the word of the prophet comes to pass, he'll be known as a true prophet. That's the litmus test. And Hananiah knows that. He, Jeremiah is just reminding Hananiah of that. Now, how's Hananiah going to respond? Is he going to be good with that, and just leave it at that? Like, okay, Jeremiah, let's just see. If it comes to pass, then we'll know who the true prophet is. If what I prophesy comes to pass, I'm the true prophet, and you're not. If what I prophesy does not come to pass, then I'm not a true prophet. I'm a false prophet, and you're a true prophet. And we'll know soon enough. But Hananiah is not going to leave it at that. You know what he does? He arrogantly takes the yoke. Keep in mind, Jeremiah is wearing this wooden yoke around his neck. He takes it and breaks it. He takes this yoke on Jeremiah's neck, removes it from Jeremiah's neck, breaks it, and reports it. So Jeremiah's yoke video is removed for violating community guidelines. <laughs> just let me have it. I'm just trying to bring it into a contemporary context here. He then posts another video on social media. This is the Hananiah Prophecy Update channel. And this video update is a video of him actually doing this, taking and breaking Jeremiah's yoke, and I mean 
this thing goes viral. And in the video, he declares, thus says the Lord, after he's taken this yoke off of Jeremiah's neck and breaks it, he says, even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And he said it just like that, because I've got the video downloaded. Now, how's Jeremiah going to respond? Well, he's over it. He just walks away, only to have the word of the Lord come to him again. And the Lord tells Jeremiah to go and tell Hananiah. See, now if I'm Jeremiah, I'd be like, yeah, no, send somebody else. Do you see what he just did? I was just getting comfortable. It matched what I was wearing, this wooden yoke that you had me made. I was declaring and prophesying as you had commanded me to. And here comes this Hananiah, and it's a public spectacle. And he's prophesying the exact opposite of what you had prophesied, me prophesy. And he's got all of these followers and subscribers, and everybody's blocking me and blaming me and slamming me and excoriating me. And now you want me to go back and talk to him after he did that? Now, <laughs> which is why I'm not Jeremiah. So what does Jeremiah do? He does what God tells him to do. And he goes to Hananiah and says, Thus says the Lord, You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made in their place yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. God said it, that settles it. Oh, and by the way, it's iron now. Try breaking that. Yeah. And he doesn't stop there. He then tells him, now keep in mind, this is done publicly, prophetically and directly, eyeball to eyeball, belly to belly. And he says, hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you but you make this people trust in a lie. You lie. Oh, I like the strength of that. See, I could totally do that. God, if you, if you got me doing that, I'm in. Where do I sign? Because I could do that. You're a false teacher. How about that? <laughs> I'd have way too much fun with it, which is why God probably would never call me or command me to do it. Uh, that's not the Lord. You're not of the Lord. You're not sent by the Lord. What you just did, you're causing God's people to trust in a lie that will never happen. And they will comfort themselves as such. And you're wrong. And I'm calling you out. Boy, this is something that you will not see in the church today. The sanctified strength of calling false teachers out for what and who they really are, false teachers. Now, Jeremiah is not done yet. God's got more for him to say to this Hananiah. He continues, therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast you, Hananiah, from the face of the earth. This year you shall die, because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. Wow. So what happened? Did he? Yeah. 
Jeremiah 28, 17, Hananiah dies exactly as Jeremiah prophesies. Get this, two months later. Man, I would, I would have loved to have been a fly on one of those yokes on one of those people if they were wearing them, because I would have loved to have seen the look on Hananiah's face. You know what, Hananiah? You're not of the Lord. You're not sent by the Lord. You're a false prophet, and you have taught the people to go against God and against, in rebellion, the Lord. And you've caused God's people to trust in something that is not only false, it's an outright lie. And for that you're going to die. And I find it ironic that, that Hananiah would falsely prophesy specifically within two full years. Oh really, Hananiah, in two months you're going to die. Am I having too much fun with this still? Maybe I, no? Are you okay? You're having fun with it too, so don't look at me all spiritual like that. Okay, Pastor, fancy pants, why are you starting out this way? Because in this account we're provided with several ways in which to discern between the Jeremiah's and the Hananiah's in these last days. And oh, by the way, they are alive and well today. So if you'll kindly allow me to, I'll build this aforementioned template upon the foundation of this account in order that all of us again, myself included, can discern between truth and what's false. And please know that while it's not exhaustive, it is practical, usable, and infinitely more importantly, biblical. So what follows is a five question template to ask and answer when faced with the opposing and dissenting prophecy teachings from Jeremiah's who say one thing and Hananiah's who say another. Example, a lot of um, so-called prophecy teachers, I never say prophecy experts, and please do not refer to me as a prophecy expert. I'm a prophecy teacher. Why? Because I'm a Bible teacher. And a third of the Bible is prophecy, so I'm also a prophecy teacher. Okay, I happen to really like Bible prophecy too. But this whole expert thing, because this prophecy expert suggests that we're already in the tribulation. But then I go to this guy's channel, he's going, no, we're not in the tribulation yet. This guy says the seals have already been open. This guy says, no, the seals have not been open or broken yet. This guy says, no, the rapture is going to happen pre-wrath, not pre-tribulation. And this guy's over here directly opposing that, saying, no, the rapture has to happen before the seven-year tribulation. In other words, you've got a lot of Jeremiah channels and a lot of Hananiah channels. And what are you going to do? Well, I've got five questions for you and for me too. Question number one, is what I'm being told or taught something that I like to hear and want to hear? Or is it something I need to hear? And it's hard to hear. You've got to know that what Jeremiah was prophesying was hard to hear. Nobody wanted to hear it. And when Hananiah falsely prophesied, they're like, yeah, that's more like it. I think I'll go to your church, Hananiah. What's the address? This is 2 Timothy 4, by the way. You know it well. 
I'll read the first four verses. In the presence of God, Paul by the Spirit writes to Timothy, and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing, rapture, and His kingdom, second coming, I give you this charge. Preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And here's why. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers like Hananiah's to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, lies. In other words, they're going to, they will not stand for it. They will not tolerate a Jeremiah. In the last days, it will mark the last days. There will be an intolerance. That's, a, that's an interesting word to use in that context, isn't it? intolerance. They're intolerant, won't put up with anyone who dares to preach the Word and the sound doctrine of God's Word of truth, even though it is unpopular and extremely uncomfortable. And what are they going to do instead? Oh, they're going to leave penalized punish, talk, stink about that church, and they're going to go to another church in great numbers that will say what their ears are itching to hear. Yeah, this is much more palatable. This is much more acceptable. This is much more tolerable. I, 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 can, I can do this. And they will have no shortage of people sitting in those seats and parking in those parking lots. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And listen to this, and my people love to have it so. They love it. But question, what will you do in the end, when it turns out that it wasn't true, but false? But again, this thing of God's people loving the false prophets. Why do they love the false prophets? Because the false prophets were telling them what they want to hear. Tell me lies, tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies. I will not sing that song, nor do I want to. I already did. I'm so sorry. Try, Jesus, please get that out of the minds, mine especially. <laughs> Isaiah 30 beginning in verse 9. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceit. In other words, don't tell me the hard truth. Tell me a smooth lie. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. In other words, stop. I will not hear it. I will not put up with it. I will not tolerate it. It's the truth, but it's hard. I don't want to hear it. I want you to stop prophesying it. And instead, you only prophesy what we tell you you can prophesy. And we're going to police you, by the way, just so you know. We've got people that are watching your videos that you put up. 
And if you start talking about these right things, hard things, we're going to email you and say, start speaking smooth things. And for the Israelites to say this about and to the prophets, Jeremiah being one, Isaiah being one, Ezekiel being one, and the many others with them, stop. We don't want to hear it. We don't like what we hear. So get out of the way. And, and cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. We don't want to hear it. We want nothing to do with it. The only thing that we're going to listen to is those who will speak to us smooth things. Proverbs 27, 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are, listen, deceitful. I know you're my friend if you'll speak the truth to me, knowing full well that it will probably be hard and hurt me and wound me knowing full well that you're jeopardizing our relationship. Because if you speak the truth to me, I may initially resent it, but eventually I'll appreciate it. And conversely, if you don't speak the truth to me and only tell me what I want to hear and multiply kisses, you're deceiving me. And that means you don't love me. You love yourself more than me. So you won't tell me the truth. And I might appreciate it initially, but eventually I'll resent it. Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you tell me the truth? Because I didn't want to hurt you. No, hurt me. Because faithful are the wounds of a friend, and they can be trusted. I mean, it's the truth, and the truth hurts, and the truth is hard, and the truth is not smooth. But I want, if you really, I know my wife really loves me, by the way, because she'll speak truth to me. In fact, I think I shared this Thursday night. I'm like, honey, there's only so much a man can take. Just, I know you love me. Just give me a little bit of a break here. Question number two. Is what I'm being told or taught moving me closer to Jesus? Or is it instead moving me closer to a man and further away from Jesus? Acts chapter 20 is one of the hardest passages of Scripture to read, let alone teach. I'll begin in verse 29. You'll bear with me. This is the Apostle Paul. Saying, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. They want you to follow them on social media. They want you to subscribe and click that Like button. But here's the problem. They're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing, and you'll know it because, here's the test. They're not drawing you closer or moving you closer to Jesus. They're distancing you further away from Jesus and creating a cult-like dependence on them, because they're drawing away disciples after themselves. So Paul goes on, and this is the hard part. It's painful, actually. He says, so be on your guard. Remember that for three years, three years, I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, 
with tears. I picture the Apostle Paul weeping bitterly, knowing that this is what was going to happen. These wolves are going to pick off the flock of God, mercilessly, relentlessly, not sparing even one sheep. It's kind of like the messengers that Jeremiah sent with the yoke saying, after we leave, there's going to come Hananiah's. They're false. They're wolves. And they will not spare you. They will in fact devour you. And I could tell you story after story of lives destroyed, marriages destroyed, churches destroyed, children, young people destroyed, don't want anything to do with God or the things of God. They'll never darken the door of a church again because of this. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you know it's the Lord if it draws you nearer to the Lord, and the Holy Spirit will only do that. If There's a prophecy teacher who has come up with something and of his own accord, his own will, his own spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit. And how are you going to know? Because the origin of it is not from man, but from God through man. Deuteronomy 13, verse 5. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be, this is called a deterrent, by the way, shall be put to death. That's a deterrent. That's what happened to Hananiah. Why? Because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage, to entice, can I say seduce, very seductive. Uh, Let me share a true story. Many years ago, I'm flipping through the channels. This is back when I watched TV. And I come across a Christian station and Joel Osteen is there on the screen. And I I was kind of new to this guy. I'd heard about him, but never really listened to the guy. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to give this guy a listen. Oh my goodness. I mean, I thought I was, you know, solid. And of course, as the pastor, I should be sound and solid and discerning. But I mean, I'm like, wow. Tell me more. I was getting mesmerized and hypnotized and brought into this whole thing about God has a potential for your life. And I'm like, He does? And yes, and He wants you to be rich like me and the other guys that need a ninth jet. And I'm like, wow. And I, I found my, and then the Holy Spirit is writhing inside of me, going, change the channel or turn it off or do something. Hurry before it's too late, because I'm getting, I'm just getting taken in and captivated by this, this teaching. And I'm just like, wow. And I could see how easy it would be for somebody to just, yeah. Preach it, Hananiah. It was very seductive. It was very enticing. 
But the problem is, it's to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst and turn that channel off. That's not in the original. I added that for emphasis. Jeremiah 23, verses 16 and 17. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace, your best life now. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, no evil shall come upon you. Come on, it's safe and effective. Is it too early for that? I think three people caught that. Let me try that again. Actually, I don't have permission to move on. In other words, don't listen to those who say, the Lord spoke to me. Wow, I wish He would speak to me. You know what the worst is, is when they say, the Lord spoke to me about you. I'm like, what, are we not on speaking terms, God and I? Why didn't He tell me? Is He mad at me? He told you to tell me? Is He giving me the silent treatment? Yes, uh, the Lord spoke to my, spoke to me. Did, Did He speak audibly? Because I've never, I'm not dismissing it, but I've never had God speak audibly. I've had God just speak to my heart unmistakably. And it was His voice. I, the sheep recognized their shepherd's voice. That's a thing, by the way, with sheep. Their, their ears are tuned to the voice of their specific shepherd. They know their shepherd's voice. So you bring in a different shepherd, they don't recognize the voice and they freak out. So as the sheep of his flock, we know his voice. And so when he speaks, it's always through his word. But that's not what this is. They're speaking like this. The Lord spoke to me and the Lord didn't speak to them. Well then, what are they talking about? No evil shall come upon you. They said, the Lord spoke to them that no evil shall come upon you. No, that wasn't the Lord. That was the dictates of their own evil, deceitful heart, (laughs) which Jeremiah says is deceitfully wicked, beyond hope. We better keep moving. Question number three. Is what I'm being told or taught manipulation or exploitation greedily geared to get me to buy something from them or give something to them? I mean, this is a, this is a biggie. I mean, they're all biggies. And again, these are not, this is not exhaustive. There are many other, you know, ways to discern, but this one, this is a, this is a biggie, because <laughs> they're in it for the money. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive, destructive heresies even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute, discredited. Why? Greed. Verse 3, in their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up, the dictates of their own heart. It's myth. It's fiction. And then Peter encourages us by saying their condemnation has been long hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. In other words, it's awake and ready, and it's not taking a nap. 
Jude, which we'll finish today, Lord willing. Verse 11, we studied this verse by itself, devoted the entire teaching to just this verse. Woe to them, a curse. Why? Because they've taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit greedily into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Proverbs 28, 25. This is very interesting. I looked it up in the original language, depending on the translation that you have. Listen to this proverb. A greedy man stirs up strife, but the one who trusts in the Lord will be enriched. I just want to go on record. I hope this doesn't come off wrong, but you will never hear, I was going to say radio or television, but we've been taken off and censored. So I guess you wouldn't hear it anyway, <laughs> at the end of a broadcast where we're saying, if you want to keep this teaching on the air, you need to give. To which I say, maybe that teaching should not stay on the air. Have you thought about that? Or how about at the end, you know, you know you're, you're being kind of, is this okay if I say it like buttered up? I know there's probably other better. <laughs> you're, you're, you're being worked, man. You're being manipulated. You're, you're, you're being coerced and sold on their latest book. Man, didn't you just come out with a book like last month? Yeah, we're doing one a month now. For 1995, you too can know the revealed, hidden secrets and keys of Bible prophecy that nobody else knows but me. <laughs> I did that too good, didn't I? <laughs> you know, or it's subscribe to my, is it called Patreon? Or, you know, hey, you know, donate. Or, hey, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. And I mean, they'll take it as far as they need to. Stop. You know, that, that is actually one of the main reasons that when I started this church 20 years ago, wow, 20 years. Wait, give me a moment here. Yeah, wow, 20 years. Oh, I got a lot of miles on me. That explains a lot. But I made the decision after seeking the Lord that we would never even so much as pass around a plate or a bag to receive an offering. In fact, I, I was so hypersensitive to this, I, I would cringe when I would hear pastors, nothing wrong with that, but I would cringe when I would hear pastors say, at this time we're going to take the offering. You ain't taking nothing, man. <laughs> yeah, right? And it's kind of like, and then they give a whole sermon on giving and tithing, the only place in the Bible where God says, test me in the tithes and the offerings. And by the time they're done, you're like, here, take my paycheck. <laughs> you know, a compulsive spender, there's such a thing as a compulsive giver. And Paul, by the Holy Spirit, makes it very clear. God doesn't want you to give compulsively. He wants you to give cheerfully of your own volition. It's a get to, not a got to. So I made the decision early on that we would never do that. So we, in fact, I bought one of those brass mailboxes from Home Depot, you know, that you put for your mail on the outside of your house. And I, it wasn't even, we actually had to lean something up to keep it up, but we put it on a folding table, and that was our tithes and offerings. And then people just gave cheerfully. And we, we, the only time we talk about money, except for today, is when we're in a place in God's Word where God's Word talks about money. And oh, by the way, just the New Testament alone, do you realize that Jesus talked more about money than He did heaven and hell combined? So at this time we will receive an offering from, you know. okay, I better, I, I just, question number four, we're getting there, just hang on. Is what I'm being told or taught ubiquitous or ambiguous? In other words, 
Is it clearly taking place and actually happening, or is it too vague to know if it's taking place and actually happening? Perhaps better asked, does the prophecy teaching accurately represent the reality of what's actually happening, or does it seem disenfranchised and even disconnected from the reality of what's actually happening? Example, in 2020, as many of you know, I <laughs> I did not hold back. I mean, I couldn't. And I just, I spoke the truth, even though it was unpopular. And I knew it was just, as I titled the Prophecy Update, I think three weeks ago, too unbelievable to be true, which is why people would buy the lie. It was just too unbelievable. No way. Way. No, that can't be. It is. No, they would never do that. They did. And then I would get the, you know, expected just, I mean, you know, your cheese gone slid off your cracker stuff, and which is sad because I really like cheese and crackers. But in other words, you've lost it. And then emails or comments would start trickling in. You know, I thought you were crazy. And then what you said in that prophecy update six months ago, it's happening. So I started listening to you again. <laughs> in other words, you stopped listening to me because that's just way too crazy. You're crazy. You've lost your mind. And then it actually represented the reality of what was actually happening. And so I thought, maybe I better listen to this guy again. That's the question that I'm presenting to you as a way to gauge whether or not something is true or false. A teacher is true or false. If, here's another example on the other side of that. 2020, you had pastors talking about the type of sandals that Jesus wore. I'm, this is a, I'm being, I'm using that as a, if you got a better one, just let me know. But I mean, so, you know, the world is changing never to be the same again. People are losing their jobs, they're losing their lives, they're losing their livelihoods, everything. And you get up there on a Sunday morning, and you're talking about the sandals that Jesus wore. Wow. You are so disconnected from reality. And then you even have the audacity to start talking about something that is, what? Nonsensical would be an understatement. It, it doesn't, it's so disconnected from the reality of what's actually happening. And that's the question you need to ask yourself. Is what they're teaching, is what they're saying, is it happening? Or is it just so, you know, it could be, they're not committal, they're not, they won't commit. You know, we could be, you know, here for another 50 years, to which I say, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. No, no, you're not. And no, we're not. Do you see what's happening? Deuteronomy 18, 21, 22, quickly. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? Here's how, verse 22, if what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Perhaps better said, do not subscribe to his channel and follow him. Jeremiah 28 verses 8 and 9. This was the chapter we just went over. This is when Jeremiah is 
talking to Hananiah directly, publicly. He says, the prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Flip that around. If what he's teaching or saying to you does not happen or is not happening, it's not the Lord. The Lord didn't send him. The Lord hasn't called him. Question number five. Is what I'm being told or taught consistent with and compatible with end times Bible prophecy specific to the demonic deception that leads many astray and away from the Lord. Let me explain briefly. Bible prophecy chiefly, supremely describes the number one sign of the end being deception. So whenever somebody is teaching Bible prophecy, if it's nothing to do with or talk about this deception, I assure you on the authority of God's holy word, it's not the Lord. They're not from the Lord. Because that's the number one sign. Listen to Deuteronomy 13. Oh, wait, I already did this one. Did I? I did. What's it doing here? Oh, this is maybe a sign from God saying, finish the thing already. Where, where am I? I lost my place. Hang on. Thank you for your grace. I lost my place. Oh, good. Here we go. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Okay. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to draw your attention to Matthew 24. (laughs) Jesus is speaking, responding to the disciples who are asking Him, what shall be the signs of your coming, the end of the age, when you return? And what Jesus answers with in verses 4 and 5 is, take heed that no one deceives you number one on his list. And he says even why, verse 5, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. For false Christ, later on, Matthew 24, verses 24 and 25, false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, be forewarned. Just like he warned, the messengers warned Judah that false prophets would come. And they even told them, this is what they're going to say. And I'm going to tell you beforehand, so when, not if they do, you'll be able to recognize them. Don't be deceived. Okay. Before we go any further, I think I'd be grossly remiss were I not to humbly submit myself and my teachings to these questions. I'm a pastor and Bible teacher of Bible prophecy, but the onus is still on you to search God's Word and not just take my word for it. That's another one, by the way. When they have the final word, You have to go to them. That's not the Lord. They, I should be encouraging you to search the Scriptures for yourself, examine the Scriptures for yourself to see if what I'm teaching is true. This is Acts 17, 11. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day. They searched the Scriptures daily, be in the Word daily. 
We don't live in a world that is forgiving of you not being in the Word daily. If there was ever time to be in the Word of God, that time is now. I honestly do not know, and I don't want this to come off wrong. I just say this in love. I don't know how a Christian can survive, let alone thrive, in these days in which we find ourselves living, absent being in the Word of God and prayer. The Word of God and prayer. I don't know how you're going to do it. Search the Scriptures daily to see if what Paul said was true. Search the Scriptures daily to see if what J.D. said was true. I will not be personally offended by it. I don't think. <laughs> we'll find out, I guess. No, I won't. Now, for the benefit of those who are new to Bible prophecy and or new to our prophecy updates, I'll take the remainder of our time, not much time, to bring you up to speed, with great speed, <laughs> as it were. But we're going to end the, you didn't think we were going to do that, did you, at this point? Well, we are now. Bye.